GM, GM, welcome back to Web3 Academy, a place where entrepreneurs, business professionals, and creators can learn how to use Web3 to build thriving communities and sustainable business models. Today on the show, we had an absolute legend, an OG in the space, Amanda Cassette joined us to talk all about what you need to know for Web3 in the coming year. She's the founder and CEO of Serotonin, which is the leading Web3 marketing agency and product studio. From 2016 to 2019, she was the chief marketing officer at Consensus. She's also the co-founder and president of Mojito, which is a NFT commerce suite that is used by Sotheby's, CAA, and many other major brands engaging in e-commerce in Web3. She also worked at the Huffington Post with Ariana Huffington. I mean, Amanda's bio is just off the charts. She's a giga brain that just brought so much knowledge to this episode. This is a must listen for everybody. Kai, what'd you think about today's episode? It's always special when you bring someone that's been in the space for so long that just gets it. And she just really gets the space. She gets the whole thing. And that's why we, we actually covered so much in this episode. I mean, it, it was, you know, it's called six web three concepts, businesses and creators must plan for in 2023. But we went through the future adoption of NFTs. We went into what community means in web three. We talked about web three marketing, which she just wrote a book on that's coming out soon, which sounds like it's going to be absolutely incredible. So we talked a little bit about that. We talked about the creator economy and how Web3 is going to change that and social media there. We even went into metaverses. We even talked about DAOs and kind of like where that's all going to go. We talked about some of her predictions of 2023 and into the future of like, what are the main drivers of adoption in Web3? Just so much. And I loved it. I love having these kind of conversations. You just get to learn just so much and think differently about the things that we are interacting with and using every single day. So it's just a pleasure to have a brain like that on the podcast. Yeah, yeah couldn't agree more. So buckle up. This is going to be a good one. Before we get into the show, let's just take a minute to hear from our sponsor. Don't trust, verify. That's the unlock of blockchain technology. The ability to store information in an open, transparent, and permissionless manner. That information may be in the form of money, value, access, data, content, and so much more. Regardless, this innovation is going to change the way that we use the internet and the way business and economies function forever. How valuable would it be to you if you were ahead of one of the most influential technological innovations of our lifetime? Staying on the forefront of Web3 will teach you where and what to build if you're an entrepreneur, where to focus your time and energy as a creator or business professional trying to stay ahead of the curve, or where to put your money if you're an investor. That's exactly what Web3 Academy Pro is doing for people just like you. I'm putting all my time and energy into these weekly reports combining on-chain analysis and industry insights to uncover what business models and technologies will win or are winning in Web3. Rather than discuss and speculate on what's happening in the space, myself and the pro team are verifying through analyzing what's happening on-chain, giving you the realest analysis in Web3. We're sending pro members weekly on-chain reports directly to your inbox. We've opened a private Discord channel exclusively for pro members to ask questions. And finally, we're also running monthly live Q&As exclusively for pro members. Signing up is simple. Head to w3academy.io slash pro today. Log in with your email you use to subscribe to Web3 Academy and sign up today. If you're ready to level up in Web3, then it's time to go pro. The number one resource to learn how to build and invest in Web3. For all you pro members out there listening, thanks for your support. And I look forward to continuing to go deeper down this rabbit hole and learning with all of you. And remember, when in doubt, look on chain. Unlock Protocol is the NFT membership protocol for Web3. Content subscriptions, community access, event tickets are all forms of memberships. One of the most common business models for creators and entrepreneurs today. Building an NFT membership opens many new possibilities for your members. Everything from tailored multi-platform experiences to the ability to sell an unfinished subscription on secondary markets. These are things just not possible in Web2. However, in order for this business model to work, creators need NFTs which are time-bound or have built-in recurring payments. Unlock Protocol does this for your NFTs. Better yet, with a few simple steps, you can create your own NFT contract without code. 
What WordPress has done for websites, Unlock Protocol is doing for membership NFTs. If you're an NFT creator, you can't rely on royalties as they are likely going to zero. You need recurring revenue. You need Unlock. At Web3 Academy, we believe NFT memberships are the future of business and community. And that's why we decided to build on Unlock. Learn more at unlock-protocol.com. Amanda, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to everybody. Good riddance to 2022 in many ways. Excited <laughs> to move in to 2023. <laughs> Amanda, we were so excited when we were planning out this episode and you know, chatting with you and your team and really wanted to give the listener an opportunity to get ahead of 2023. What are the concepts they need to be thinking about? And so we got six concepts that came from both our brain and your brain, Amanda, that we really want to lay out for business professionals and creators to make sure that they are prepared for, you know, what do you need to be thinking about when you're writing your 2023 strategy? How do you plan for Web3? And obviously, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not easy with so much going on and so much change happening. And your brain is really the perfect person to give that overview for our audience. So super excited. So let's start out with NFTs and NFT mania is over, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, we'll debate on a separate time, but you know, really, I think in 2023, we're going to see real utility come for NFTs, not just speculation. So I want to start with what are the categories of NFTs that you're most excited about in this coming year? Yeah, absolutely. So NFTs are a tool. They're not a set of outcomes. People tend to think about technology in terms of the manifestations of it that they see. And so maybe they think of an NFT as a piece of monkey cartoon artwork, but that's not what an NFT is, right? It's a substrate or a clay or a set of tools that people can mold to do all kinds of things that they want them to do. And there's a way in which the art use case for NFTs is almost like using an army tank to transport a kitten because it's such a powerful technology that's linked <laughs> to the, the, that's the very decentralized, good. Yeah, that's right? Analogy. That's linked to the decentralized Ethereum blockchain. And it's, it's the same thing as other types of tokens except for that it's non-fungible. So each one can have this individual identity or properties that make it not be able to be easily exchanged with other tokens the way that a single ETH token is fungible with another ETH token. So art has been one of those use cases so far. One of the use cases I'm seeing a lot of is membership and reward programs. We saw that with Starbucks. We saw it starting with Chipotle. We get to see a lot at Serotonin before it comes out to the public mm -hmm. because we work with a lot of these major brands and it takes a long time to launch these types of programs. So there's a lot more of that. It's basically the best ever version of airline miles. And mm -hmm. there's no reason for brands to not start building their communities in Web3 so they can develop that CRM, um, that customer relationship management database on chain that they can then use forever to continue retargeting the same customers that have gotten NFTs from them. So I think we're gonna see a lot, of more, lot more of those airline miles style rewards programs. The second one is membership. So whether it's an expensive membership or an inexpensive membership, we're seeing a lot of brands and also really expensive luxury brands saying, maybe if we have a, a club that costs $100,000 for a membership, people would be more willing to purchase that membership if it were an NFT. So then they can trade out of that membership if they stop wanting it anymore, if they don't want to use it anymore. And so then you get customers with a mentality that they're not consuming the funds that they spend on that membership. They're rather investing those funds or even just parking those funds because they would be able to trade out of it. And this started to get to a concept that Glenn Weil introduced in Radical Markets, which is an economy, and in this case, a digital economy, where people are buying things temporarily, intentionally, using them while they have them, and then reselling them to someone else. And you get a buyer with a really different kind of mentality that would potentially be more willing to purchase a higher price item in, in that case. So it's really exciting for brands. Then we're also starting to see a lot more 
fidgetal. I don't love this word. Mm -hmm. I didn't come Nobody up with does. it. I take no responsibility <laughs> for it. Um, but we're do, do you have these. another, do you have another word that you do like? We use physical back tokens <laughs> a lot. We like that more than fidgetal, I find. You know, if there's one thing I've learned about memetics, once it catches on, it's here to stay. I actually try <laughs> to have ICOs not be called ICOs because it rhymes with IPO. And I knew eventually mm -hmm. that would upset somebody. And so at Consensus, we actually very mildly tried to get people to call it TGEs, token generation events, but ICO had already caught the world by <laughs> storm. So, so we were, we were fighting against the grain. And so I think we might be stuck with digital. Digital it is. Tough world. <laughs> <laughs> but we're seeing a lot more digital. So at the, at the most fundamental level, an NFT can serve as a more robust version of a receipt. And that's a super simple mm -hmm. NFT that just confirms that something is authentic and that you own it. Basically a digital, non-fungible, rarefiable version where you can track provenance of the certificate of authenticity that has traditionally come with especially higher price items or a more advanced version of a receipt that would come with lower price items. That's the lightest weight version of this digital concept all the way to the heaviest weight version, which is where the digital piece is also its own artwork or has its own utility or has its own value in some way that corresponds creatively with the physical piece in some manner. And those things can be sold separately. They can be sold together. There can be all kinds of incentive links that make a buyer want to keep them together. And I think we're gonna see a lot more creativity of those links between the physical and the digital all across the spectrum from a really mm -hmm. advanced receipt to its own kind of separate work or, or piece of art or utility-based token. So those would be my three. I just wanna jump in and, and go back to the first part on the, the loyalty rewards and, and memberships, I guess, kind of you can combine them. You said brands are moving into this because they see this as kind of like a CRM, as a way that they can remarket or retarget their users years down the road. And I'm just curious how you or the brands are thinking about this now when it's such an early stage and not a lot of people have wallets, right? Because this is what you're referring to in terms of like being able to retarget or remarket is when they get an NFT or something in their wallet that's there for forever kind of thing. How are you guys thinking about this where not a lot of people have wallets yet? So do we have to then get their wallets first? In Starbucks case, they sort of just made the wallet and they made it kind of in this sort of closed system. And then also the wallets that we currently have, let's say we have a MetaMask wallet. Do we think that this is the wallet that we're going to have five years from now? Or do we not think there's going to be better tech and we're probably going to end up having different wallets? And now it's like you're kind of collecting these wallets that aren't really relevant two, three years from now. I'm just curious on your thoughts on that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go in order. A lot of the big brands missed the web when it first came out, and eventually the web became a heterogeneous mix of existing companies that managed to adapt quickly enough and web-native companies. And so many types of businesses got their lunch eaten by web-native companies because they were too slow to adapt mm -hmm. that they are correctly in a rush to make sure they're in the first wave of Web3. So they're less concerned about the number of existing Web3 users than the rate of onboarding new Web3 users. Mm -hmm. And that rate is spectacular. There was a great quote that I want to maybe add to the, the show notes. It was a tweet from Andrew Steinwald that I'll share with you from Spermian, which is a big NFT investor, about the growth rate of NFT adoption in 2021. And that was something like 21,000%. And when Jeff Bezos first started Amazon, he saw web usage growing at something like 2,000%. So that's a mm. lot higher. And those are the numbers that brands that are smart are, are thinking mm. about when it comes to being on the first train to start in Web3. Every company is going to become a Web3 company. It's just a matter of time. It's a matter of who's going to get there first and whose lunch is going to get eaten because they were too late. Mm. So I think that's the correct mentality. And on the second question, so I was part of Consensus. I was chief marketing officer there from 2016 through 2019. One of our most prominent products at Consensus was always MetaMask, which is the mm -hmm. most popular Web3 native self-sovereign wallet. I really don't think there's been a lot of wallet innovation actually since the original MetaMask, frankly. Agreed. And it's done a great job of serving users. We learned a lot in 2022 about custodial wallets and wallets that live on exchanges <laughs> where users don't actually have the keys and MetaMask 
has provided a really high quality self-sovereign alternative. And it's been cool how NFT onboarding, unlike crypto trading onboarding, is immediately self-sovereign. So mm. immediately people that are new to NFTs come into self-sovereign wallets generally, whereas people that get into trading usually come in through these big custodial centralized exchanges. So actually NFT adoption has been huge for getting people their own self-sovereign wallets. In, in terms of the future, I think it's really possible that every single brand would have its own white labeled that brand branded wallet. It, it, it's a little strange for a big brand to want to bring a, a, a second party brand name into the funnel when they're mm -hmm. transacting with their business. That's why businesses that use Shopify, for example, Shopify is humming in the background or ones that use Salesforce demand where that's humming in the background because they don't want to bring other brands and logos into their experience. So I would guess that in the future, we're going to see white labeled versions of, of wallets. And in terms of custody, one thing that we're pioneering at Mojito, which is Tonin's first spin out, it serves Sotheby's Metaverse, CAA, a bunch of other marketplaces with NFT e-commerce infrastructure, kind of like Shopify. So what we're seeing there is a lot of new newcomers come into a given NFT sale. They need a wallet. They don't currently have a wallet. You can also come into that with MetaMask. And they aren't ready in their Web3 journey to solely take the keys. So what we've pioneered there and what I think others are also going to do are progressively custodial wallets. So you start with something like the Gnosis multisig contract where you have all sets of keys to the wallet. Perhaps the platform owns one, perhaps the vendor own, owns one, perhaps the user, maybe there's a, another trusted party. Mm -hmm. And then as the user gets educated about Web3, and if they decide, they can boot everyone else out of the multisig and have self-sovereign unilateral control over the wallet with their own set of keys. That way, if someone who's pretty new to Web3 loses their seed phrase right out of the gate and loses control, someone else can come and help them get the assets, but that they still can choose at their own free will to move the assets out of that wallet into another wallet that they solely control or to mm -hmm. take sole control of that wallet. And I think that's really important because if all you're doing when you're making NFTs or you're onboarding into Web3 is bringing people into the world of Web2 style custodial solutions, that's not actually Web3 onboarding. That, that, that's, that's just uh, more, more of the same. Jay, you've been calling on the rollup for the last few weeks that all these companies are going to have their own wallets. So I love that that Amanda just said that as well. <laughs> Thank, thanks. Thanks for the confirmation. Yeah, yeah, my, yeah, I got my you. calls, they're not all right. They're not all right. But sometimes <laughs> don't trust my NFT investing advice. That's for sure. <laughs> Starbucks and loyalty. I think so. My prediction is this is going to be one of the biggest onboarding ramps of 2023. I think Starbucks is going to onboard millions, assuming they get out of beta and into mass market. And I just want to chat a bit about that and what what your thoughts are on like why loyalty is such a good use case. What I'm seeing that is so interesting to me is the current loyalty programs, all they can do is basically offer you points and then offer you discounts as a result of having those points. You get discounts or you get free things. There's never been this opportunity where now I can create something else digital that is very low cost to give you as opposed to having to go make a physical item for you. I have to go make a certain mug or make a t-shirt for you because you reached a certain number of points. And I think that there's this huge unlock in the ability to give somebody a digital good, assuming we all care and want digital goods. This sort of connects to what you were saying about the, the receipt in a way in that when we buy something physical, if we care enough about that physical thing, just having that digital receipt is also cool. It's almost like a flex item to be like, yeah, yeah, I own this and now I have proof of this. So I, I'm just, I'm curious, what is it about loyalty that gets you and rewards that gets you so excited in Web3? Yeah, sure. So you can obviously send people rewards in a natively digital way by sending them fungible tokens or NFTs to those addresses. There are also a lot of restrictions around storing identity data. And mm. 
basically what that blockchain CRM is, is buying behavior without identity data attached to it. So when you're using something like Facebook Business Suite, you're extrapolating buying behavior from identity data, but this is pure buying behavior without any stored identity data. Also, you're not storing this massive trove of data and information yourself. It's out there on the public chain. You're just indexing it, which is gonna be a lot more accurate and a lot less vulnerable to theft, manipulation, hacks, issues. It's gonna be really highly accurate data because it's gonna go back to actual purchases and history. It'll withstand the updating of computer systems that, that large mm -hmm. businesses use and, and all, the, all the kinds of issues that come with that. Another really interesting one is if you're another business and you're looking at someone else's customer set, you can actually target someone else's customer set. Uh, like let's say, mm -hmm. let's say Starbucks has all of its rewards data out on, let's say the public Ethereum blockchain. You as Pete's Coffee, would be able to potentially target that audience or some segment of that audience with an NFT, a fungible token, a claim, an airdrop that would give you give them some kind of special benefit. So it's great for partnerships, friendly or unfriendly, and all kinds of cross-targeting. Very interesting. Let's move from NFTs to community. Community is the other very important part of Web3. And yeah, I guess I'll just put it out to you. Like, what does what does community mean to Web3? Why is community so important in Web3? Yeah, so the word community in Web3 can sound kind of high-minded, but mm -hmm. I actually think it means something very specific, which is the fact that Web3 collapses the category of investor, user, and team into a single economically incentive-aligned category, which is called community. The, the potential there is to bring the consumer who was a consumer, they were at arm's length from your business into your actual process and have them align to make your project even better. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to do any everything yourself anymore. Once you build a community around your project, you can lean on that community to help you with your marketing. You can lean on them to actually build or audit the code. You can lean on them to test your product for bugs. And so you can gradually decentralize a lot of functions of business away from a core team and toward a group of people that's actually motivated to, to help you, which is a more efficient long-term model for marketing. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of Web2 marketing, and this is, this is a lot of what my book is about. I wrote a book called Web3 Marketing. That's one of the first business books about Web3 to be published by a major publisher. That's coming out from Wiley in April of 2023. April Woo! 4th, and we should we're have so, the, we're so stoked. Yeah, yeah. I can't wait. <laughs> and we should have the <laughs> we should have the pre-order link live pretty soon, if not already. I think that'll be maybe in the show notes as well. But one of my ideas there is that this community building exercise is a more sustainable way to do marketing over the long term than the way that marketing was done in Web 2. In Web 2, marketing is basically an arbitrage between customer acquisition cost and lifetime customer value that takes place mm -hmm. on a third party platform. Maybe that's one of the Facebook advertising suite, maybe that's Google ads, and you're paying that platform over and over, you're hooked in order to just reach your own audience and keep spinning that revenue flywheel. And if you stop, then that revenue and those results are gonna stop. But with Web3 marketing, you're gathering a group of people with all kinds of different skill sets and you're using the substrate of Web3 to build an incentive aligned system such that they're going to be motivated to do all those kinds of things for you in a long-term way. I love that analogy of community being a much better form of marketing and not an extractive form of marketing as we currently have in the Web2 world. I'm just curious, when you talk to brands about building community, I think the difficult part is we've seen a lot of people in web three build community. That's not sustainable, right? We've seen a lot of people do big airdrops and community goes up and everyone just expects to make money and then poof, falls off a cliff. Right? So what are the ways that you see as the best ways to build sustainable community? So at serotonin, the way we always talk about community is like a group of aliens on a spaceship come and they come to planet earth and they drop a ladder down somewhere and people get on the spaceship, then the spaceship flies away, then those aliens are stuck with those people indefinitely. And those are the people that are in their community. And so if, if, if that's what's at stake, you wanna be really careful about where you land your spaceship, where you choose to put down your ladder and who you let on the ship. 
at the very mm. beginning of a project, the project founders will have a lot of control over who joins their early community. And that's the moment they can really have an impact selecting and welcoming people with the right skill sets to offer, with interest in actually using the product, not just in some kind of airdrop or reward. Maybe if the project is more focused on developers, there are folks that are interested in that technology or contributing to that code base. Maybe if it's an NFT project, people that are interested in that artist or in, or in that style of art. It, it's about getting people in there that are there for the long haul and that, that care about your project and want to contribute to your project then those early people are going to set the tone disproportionately of who else feels the desire to join. And eventually the community gets to a scale where it's out of the original founder's hands, what the tone of that community is. And that's why it's so important to make those right choices early on. Now for brands, a lot of brands, when they first decide to do something in Web3, they don't know that they're going to have to put a full team on it for the indefinite future. And mm -hmm. at Serotonin, we only work with brands that are in it for the long haul, that plan to actually grow projects, build projects, have real roadmaps, are ready to staff community channels, make them really fun, entertaining, always have something around the corner. You can't just suddenly drop a project and then go away. And I've seen exactly what you've seen, which is if they're big brands or if they're Web3 native projects that construct their community wrong that bring in everyone through extrinsic incentives without any kind of intrinsic incentive, just through rewards, just through airdrops. You get a bunch of people saying when moon on those channels <laughs> instead of offering to help and contribute. And I think an uneducated or potential user or participant might look at that, look at that discord channel or might look at that telegram or look at that Twitter account and say, oh, there are a lot of followers here. But mm -hmm. if they actually look at the quality of the content, it's no good. Mm -hmm. And I think educated investors, users, builders can look at that community and not be fooled by surface level numbers and metrics and actually look at the content, which is what's really important there. I think one of the things that surprised me in 2022 was the amount of big brands that launched Discord servers. I was just like, this is for some reason surprising to me. And I mean, some have done a great job of it. Some, I think, maybe just didn't know what they were doing and everyone's launching Discord. This is the way we do it. So we got to do it too. Do you think that Discord is the way that we go and continue? Like, do you like the platform Discord? And do you think that that's where community is going to be made online? Or do you think that this is just a in-between thing and eventually we start to do something else with community? Because it's just, it's odd to me that all these really big Fortune 500 companies and big brands are all launching Discord servers. <laughs> yeah, so I think Discord became the chat platform of choice for Web3 communities early on for a couple of reasons. One, there's a lot of Venn diagram overlap between gamers who traditionally use Discord and the people that are technically adept enough to use Web3 and interested in Web3. And then the second reason is that Discord was very early to integrate Web3 mechanisms like token dating that allow people to enter channels based on whether they hold a Web3 crypto token. And because of those two factors, Discord took off as the de facto community platform of choice. That being said, there are a lot of communities on Telegram, and I know maybe five different projects that are working to build Web3 native chat tools mm -hmm. and Web3 native social. It seems really obvious to me that there's a way to build that from the ground up. You should be able to sign in with your wallet and be able to chat with someone that's provably the owner of another wallet. And whether you want to identify yourself with a real name or with a handle is up to you. But it seems obvious to me that the, that the wallets are kind of the base layer of a communication system that's based on a value system. And it's interesting because the current Web2 is a communication system that has the value system layered on top. And, and, and we're just flipping that. We're going to get down to having the value system at the core and the communication on top. People are trying to do this. I think eventually we're going to see a heterogeneity of platforms. I think we're eventually going to see a Web3 platform win and or Discord update itself to be more Web3 native right. if it wants to stay winning. One thing I'm really excited about for 2023 is Web3 social. I think Lens Protocol coming mm -hmm. out of Aave is pretty interesting. They're really starting at the protocol level for building reputation, for letting people communicate using wallets as a base layer, 
and people are building all kinds of different social applications on top. It means that your audience can be portable, your reputation can be portable, your content can be portable. You can you can chat from a specific wallet. I don't know exactly what what the right social app is, but I know that the answer is a protocol, and then there will be dozens of right apps. Right. Yeah, let's move on to Web3 Social. You actually just queued up the next concept. So, well, that's perfect. So I think that the foundations have been set for Web3 Social. As you said, mm-hmm. we've, got, we've got the foundation set. But now we're sort of at this place where I'm not sure what is, what's the next step. Do we need more users to come on to Web3 Social? But we also need more dApps to be created on Web3 Social. What do you see? What do you think is coming in 2023? Is it the creators that need to be focused? And if it is the creators, what's the playbook that they should be focused on? Well, a lot of people are saying that crypto token prices are expected to be more or less flat through 2023. And so it's a great year for building. And it's a great year for all kinds of activities on Web3 that aren't as correlated with trading activity. And one of those is social activity, building reputation, doing stuff that doesn't involve trading massive amounts of currency, betting that the market's going to go up or go down. So I think it's a great time for Web3 Social, even if it starts in that building phase with a smaller number of users, optimizes how it actually looks and feels so that people want to play with it. And then as the next wave of new entrants come into Web3, that it's ready and and that it's exciting. And so I think There are a lot of people starting to build on Lens Protocol right now. I think having as many at-bats as possible of the right social app, it just makes it more likely that one of them is really good. I think starting with a small but devoted community, that's how I'm going to identify that one of them is really good, right? Mm -hmm. Not because there are a million users or a billion users, but because there are 1,000, 10,000 users that are coming back to it multiple times every day starting with these niche communities, making them bigger, right? Facebook started just at Harvard. Maybe it'll have some kind of aspirational appeal to begin with, or maybe it'll be niche and and it'll be more targeted toward a certain type of person or a certain type of community at first. Those are probably what what I would expect. Once we have those niche communities and those strong communities on an app that is performing well and has great UX, what makes people finally make the jump from one app to the other? Because For me, when I look at Web3 Social, I mean, I love it, but I had my Facebook account banned and blocked when I was running a business on it. So I lost everything, right? So like for me, the moment I heard of of Ethereum, number one, I was like, oh shit, this is perfect. And then when I heard of Web3 Social and what Lens is doing, I was like, oh, this is amazing. Like, of course we need this. I can move from any application. No one can ban me. I own my content. I own my profile. This is perfect for me. Most people don't have that Mm -hmm. experience though. And so I think most people struggle to wrap their head around that. Or even if they do wrap their head around that, they're still like, whatever. I don't really care. I don't run a business on social. I just use it to interact with friends and to like view other content, et cetera. So I'm just wondering, is there, is there something in your mind where you're like, this is the thing that's going to get people to finally move over and get a wallet and join in on Lens or whatever other Web3 social? A couple of things on that. I think a lot of us have a certain incumbency bias where we assume the big leaders today are always going to be the leaders. People were saying that Mm -hmm. Facebook and Instagram and Twitter were the last big social platforms, Mm -hmm. that it's not worthwhile to invest in or try to found another social platform because it's saturated, then TikTok comes along. Mm -hmm. And I think I think it'll be that same thing, right? It's not done. It's always going to evolve. Second, I had a bunch of friends who spent a lot of time building their Facebook audience. And now they look at that and think of it as time very poorly spent because that audience isn't portable off platform onto a new platform, they can't convert them because the audiences are all off of Facebook. I think for creators, the promise of portability and not being locked into a single platform will get them to adopt Web3 Social because they know they could always port their audience over to another Web3 Social platform. So it's a lower threshold for them to decide to experiment with a platform because Mm. that time isn't gonna go to waste. Then you get the chicken and egg effect between creators and audiences where creators come, audiences come, more creators come, more audiences come. And so I think that's mm-hmm. going to be the trajectory. Creator focus makes sense. You got to get the creators over. I get that. Let's touch on your book. You teased it a little bit earlier. We're all super mm-hmm. excited for your Web3 Marketing book to come out titled Web3 Marketing, I believe is the title. <laughs> so, and it's coming out in April, first of its kind. 
Can you give us a sneak peek? Is there a framework or a model that you can share with us? Give us an idea of what we can look forward to. Yeah, absolutely. So the title isn't very creative. I just wanted people to know, know what it was. It's called Web3 Marketing, but the subtitle is a little better. A handbook for the next internet revolution. So hope, hopefully people can get excited about it. I spend a lot of time in the book going over the history of Bitcoin, Ethereum, Web3, the metaverse, how those things all came about, going into a lot of detail over what are NFTs, what are fungible tokens, what are DAOs, what's DeFi, mm. basically putting tools in the toolkit of non-technical professionals, many for the first time, so they can see all these things as a substrate, as moldable clay that they can use to achieve their particular ends. And that's how I've really made the book evergreen because I think that Web3 is really a set of tools and people come to it with different goals, different intentions, People have different kinds of organizations, businesses, projects, and this is about teaching them what Web3 is. So the power is theirs and they can, and they can use those powers. So I really spend over half the book on that because mm -hmm. I think there's a real dearth of materials for non-technical people who are interested in this space and what got us here won't get us there. When I started working in the Ethereum world in 2015, Almost everyone was a developer, a computer scientist, an academic. That was great. It was some of the most brilliant people I'd ever met. And I knew that this movement was going to take off because it had attracted such a special group of human beings. But what got us to this threshold of adoption won't get us to the next one. And I think it's going to be not just marketers in a, in a narrow sense, but teachers, community leaders, people that want to step mm -hmm. up within their own companies and lead Web3 transformation. It's going to be people coming right out of college and deciding on a career path that, that studied history or philosophy or economics that, that get us there. And so the first two thirds are really about giving them everything they need to make this their own. The last third is history. It's about a lot of what's worked and what hasn't and why. So how to think about marketing in a web three way, we're not just paying the piper, we're not just arbitraging cost of customer acquisition against lifetime customer value on these third party platforms. What we're doing is building sustainable incentive aligned communities using mm -hmm. the substrate of web three, which is an incentive alignment engine in order to create these long term sustainable motivated groups of people that'll go on to build code bases, go on to market projects, go on to come up with the creative ideas that'll ultimately make them successful. So we outlined that kind of marketing paradigm, the, the, the marketing funnel and the process that a marketer or someone with a marketing mindset should go through with a project from ideation to the zero to one problem, how to get that community formed and flywheel spinning to how to actually think about handing off a lot of functions to a community. Mm. This is a wonderful explanation of Web3 marketing, by the way. <laughs> and uh, we won't go too far into, into the book because obviously I think everyone should just read it when it comes out. But I am I'm curious, when you think of Web3 marketing, and you sort of touched on it there, I'm just wondering what you see as like the main, either main differences or I guess what you would say is like the main strategy that you're thinking. And again, you don't have to go too far into it, but versus Web2 marketing. Like Web2 marketing obviously is around ads and, and a lot of things like you said, I'm just curious, what's that main difference there with Web3? Is it community or is there more to yeah, it? Like what, you, exactly. what would be your framework there? It's building a marketing system. It's almost protocol level versus application level in a certain way, hmm. where it's a bunch of, Web2 marketing is a bunch of activities that are going to be done by a centralized marketing function, paying other centralized platforms in order to serve ads. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is about designing a self-marketing system. So even before you've built any community, even before you've decided on your name, it's about design, designing a system of incentives using the substrate that is Web3 that's going to get people extrinsically and intrinsically in some combination motivated to, to continue building your project. And that's really what matters. The only thing I would say is when people hear this, I think a lot of people are like, you got to give away money, you got to airdrop, you got to inflate your currency and give things away. And we've seen time and time again, like that works short term to get a bunch of people interested in your project. And then it goes to zero, right? And it just happened so many times in 2020, 2021 with NFTs and with fungible tokens. And so I'm just curious your thoughts on like, 
how do you start to do that where you're not just inflating away token or you're just giving away free value that ends up obviously not holding value? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so here's what's totally not different about Web2 and Web3 marketing. The first step is to know your product and to try to have product market fit. And the second mm -hmm. step is to know your audience. And you're trying to find that right balance between offering the right product that you can describe really clearly to the right audience that you know really well and wants the product. And what you can't do is use Web3 to get out of the fact that you need to find product market fit for your product. <laughs> if it's some kind of Web3 utility, if it's a Web3 utility or software product, who are the users of that? Do they actually want this? Are you solving a problem? Are you charging the right amount to solve the problem? If you're trying to bring them into a technical community, are you building technology that's going to interest them and move the space forward such that they would care to engage with it? Whether it's intrinsic incentives or intrinsic or extrinsic incentives, are they the right ones for the people that you're trying to attract? If it's an NFT series, let's say it's a major brand dropping an NFT series, are there people in the Web3 community that would want this and that have said that they would want something like this? Are you charging the right amount for it if, if you're charging anything? If it's people who are already fans of your brand, have you done tests to prove that they would want an NFT or a digital collectible or digital good that does X kind of thing or X kind of membership? You can't use Web3 to get around needing product market fit. You can't get around having a good product. You can't get around having to know your audience as a marketer. Tokens are not the product of the business. They are a tool that helps you amplify your product or business or helps you provide more utility or whatever it is to your product or business, but they are not the product itself. So I'm, I'm really glad Here's you said what that. I, I would actually, I'd actually add this about tokens. I think that there's enough hype around fungible tokens, non-fungible tokens at certain periods in the market that people get the mistaken idea that by making it a token or by making it an NFT, that they can make something have value that doesn't have demand for it intrinsically. Yeah, yeah, what you're right. doing by making something a token or making it an NFT, it's just a mode for capturing and expressing a type of value mm -hmm. and bringing it into fungibility such that it can be exchanged for other blockchain-based tokens of value. What you're not doing is creating value out of thin air. You're going mm -hmm. and finding something that already has value and you're putting a certain type of cell wall around it so that can participate as part of some kind of like economic organism. And so you're doing something very cool and you may look at the map and see that there's a bunch of value there that wasn't, but what you're doing with these mechanisms, with these tools is putting cell walls around value that already exists somehow. Like mm. this art is so cool, it already exists. This tool is so, is so cool, it has value. And, and, and you're just capturing that value in a novel way and bringing it into exchangeability. But you're, you're, not, you're not creating value out of nothing. Right. And that cell wall, that, that, that package you're saying, which could be an NFT or fungible token, doesn't even have to have value, right? It's just also just another way to exchange, move things around, track things on the internet, right? So it doesn't even necessarily have to wrap value. It could wrap non-value, but just something that someone wants to hold on to or move around to someone else, right? Which like lends protocol you're not with a lot one. of our content. Totally. And, and you're not the one who decides whether it has value, right? Correct. I mean, if you yeah, decide yeah. to put that cell wall around something that other people in a marketplace deem is valuable and, and the supply matches the demand correctly, then it can have value, but it's ultimately mm. going to be the market that determines whether something has value. You can have a thesis about something having a certain type of value and deciding to put that cell wall around it because you believe that, but it's going to be buyers and that contrasted with supply that's going to determine what anything's price is. I want to use this analogy as a jumping point into the next concept, the fifth, fifth concept we want to talk about, which is around metaverses. And the way I'm going to jump into it is that there was a time in 2022 when there was probably six or seven projects that did create value, $100 million of value a few times just by selling metaverse land, which whether or not that is truly valuable or not in the long term, time will tell. But there is certainly consumer interest in the metaverse, a lot more than crypto right now. A lot of studies and surveys have shown, and that might just be the word metaverse is more friendly to, to the consumer. But I'm curious, what's your view of the current status of the metaverse? How do you think about it? How are you talking about it with your clients at Serotonin? Is, is this something that you see brands spending time on? Or do you still think this is like far away? 
Yeah. So I think everything is going to be a, a supply and demand thing. I think metaverse worlds are going to be able to attract participants when there's a great fit between what they're offering in their world and what people that would participate in something like that wanted. And a great way to think about the Web3 enabled metaverse worlds like Decentraland and Sandbox is really like a town. If you measure their performance by gaming metrics, it can sometimes look like a game where nobody's playing or one day it'll look like a game where everybody's playing. But really it forms much more like a town. People buy land, people develop the land, then because there are more people using it, they can afford more kinds of interesting services. They attract more maybe musical events, maybe cool venues, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe brand sponsorships, maybe stores and shops and games, and then they grow. And so we're just at that very first inning of that evolution of these kinds of towns. We have some really exciting, I think Decentraland and Sandbox being the leaders are really interesting worlds to explore and to build in. We actually, so one of our, so we work with Decentraland and we also work, Decentraland is a client. We, we often work with Sandbox as well. Sotheby's, who, who we've done their whole Web3 transformation, partnered with them very closely. We helped them build a replica of the New York Sotheby's auction house in Decentraland where people can actually watch live auctions because the auction house in New York can't fit everybody. And they started mm -hmm. accepting bids in ETH and more people come to watch those auctions in the Decentraland location than in New York, which is very special. And so it's totally a matter of usage is a matter of product market fit. We're trying to encourage our partners to create storefronts there that really have their personality and will attract their kinds of consumers. And that's been going really well. I think ultimately for brands, the metaverse is Rodeo Drive, Madison Avenue. I think it's an updated version of the shopping mall. And when I say shopping mall, I don't mean in some kind of materialistic plastic way. I mean, my shopping mall of the 90s, which is where I hung out with my friends, which is where I mm -hmm. played arcade games and got food and hung out, maybe occasionally bought something, but often not. And so I think it's going to be this new, this new social meeting place that has a commercial side to it. And that's really how we're encouraging them to view it. And then for businesses that are thinking about e-commerce and payments, that whole e-commerce experience is going to need to be recreated in a 3D metaverse context. People are going to want to try on clothes. People are going to want to see what furniture would look like in their house. And then people are going to want to check out in some kind of novel way. And I think that the field is really open for experimentation there. Yeah, I think that it is very powerful to think about it like the mall of the 90s, like the place that you yeah. go to hang out. <laughs> the, the, I think that the question on my mind, when you're talking to a client, obviously there's not a ton of users there yet. So is the reason that a brand would build in the metaverse, again, is it come back to your first point of don't miss out and don't be too late to the party. And so you just build to be there or is there... Is there economic value to be gained for a brand from being there? Yeah. So whenever a brand goes into Web3, they're going to get a mix of existing Web3 users and people that are mm -hmm. fans of their brand, noticing that their brand has done something new. So if your brand goes and does an activation in Decentraland, some portion of the people that come to what your brand does are going to be people that were using Decentraland. And some portion of them are going to be people that are excited about your brand and want to meet your brand in a novel, more engaging, super exciting kind of way. And so a, a, a brand or a company that's, that's doing something in, a, a, in, a, in one of these worlds, they should probably go with one of the larger, more, more established ones in order to maximize folks coming from that partnership to their activation. But they're also going to bring a lot of people with them and be able to engage those people in a really new way. So mm -hmm. the thing that is the most interesting to me about Web3, I feel like, is that there's so many different industries and niches and brands that are in so many different areas that are all bringing people into Web3. Like the whole idea is like you need people to have a wallet, right? Let's get people wallets. And that's like what we're all trying to do, regardless of who you are. And it's funny that you have the DGENs over here that are getting people with wallets because there's yield and whatever. And they're like, we need more people with wallets. And then you have Sotheby's over here in Decentraland that's also bringing people with wallets. You have Starbucks, Reddit. Everyone is just doing their part right now to bring people in and like get them their wallets. I think ultimately that's why Web3, which you talked about at the beginning, has such a fast adoption rate, which I'm assuming is very similar to the internet, right? 
there's all these businesses that started and you get a few people here from this industry, from sports, from this, from this. And it's just like all of a sudden everyone's just on the internet. And I feel like the same thing is happening with Web3 and ultimately, I guess, with the metaverse as well. But it's just cool to watch this all kind of play out. I don't know if you see it the same yeah, way. Yeah, I agree. Totally. I think everyone is following their incentives and all incentives lead to Web3. And mm. many of them lead to Web3 enabled metaverse worlds. I like that. Way to, way to run with it. <laughs> we might we might make that the new tagline for our podcast. <laughs> it's very good. It's very good. <laughs> okay, let's move on from metaverses to DAOs. Are DAOs working? Are they working? And what's working and what's not working? And then I guess curious from your perspective on working more on the brand side on how you see the future of DAOs or the usage of DAOs for a corporation, for a brand. Or if you think yeah, about sure. that. Yeah, sure. So, so first of all, are DAOs working? Are DAOs not working? I would remind everyone that DAOs are, not to be a broken record, but they're a substrate. They're a substrate mm -hmm. for building governance machines. Governance machines being built out of people. And a lot of DAOs allow our, our investment-focused DAOs that allow people to vote proportionally to what they've invested on the investment decisions of the group, like the original Ethereum DAO. And we all remember what happened to that. Then you get governance DAOs like Maker, where you have some of the governance token and that governance token entitles you to make decisions proportionally to a lot of how the platform act or the protocol actually works in, in a DeFi context. Those are probably the two most prominent kinds of DAOs mm -hmm. and they work. So, so Maker is governed by a DAO and that has worked really well. Uh, we've mm -hmm. seen all kinds of stable coins blow up and have problems, especially centralized stable coins or really poorly constructed algorithmic coins. But DAI has been incredible. And the Maker platform has been working this whole time, even while we've seen centralized platforms collapse and go up in smoke. So that's a DAO that's doing an incredible job, doing a lot of the governance related to one of the largest DeFi lending protocols. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a lot of DeFi going in that DAO direction. And I think we're going to see a lot of them maybe throw off some of their entities. We've seen shapeshift move in that in that DAO direction. And I think it's it's really important for DeFi. In terms of these investment DAOs, that's where you get a lot of this proportional weighted voting according to how much of how much you've invested in the DAO. I think that works really well too. So Flamingo DAO is one of the biggest NFT collecting DAOs. They had over a billion in assets during some of the heights of the bull market. I'm not sure exactly what that's at now, but they do have some of the most exciting assets in the space. Also, Pleaser DAO has done an incredible job getting some very cool Web3 native assets into a pool where people own them collectively and make decisions collectively on what to buy and what to sell and can also withdraw their funds whenever they want. And there's some kind of schedule on which they take distributions. So it's really good for making these kinds of governance decisions because you can get to market immediately without having to form a kind of official investment vehicle and you can even do it legally tribute labs i mean it's not it's not up to me to say whether something's legal or not but tribute labs <laughs> which came out of open law from consensus and is led by aaron wright who's one of the premier legal scholars in the web3 space he's a professor of law at cardozo he has created this framework called the lao for how DAOs can have an associated legal entity that leads them in, in his opinion to to function properly and with with regulatory compliance and so mm -hmm. you can have these structures that are very easy to spin up. You can create governance very quickly. You can get a bunch of people in quickly to make these kinds of decisions together and have a great outcome. Where, where DAOs can run off the rails is if the type of activity that the DAO wants to do isn't a great match for the governance structure that it's architected for itself. Like the kind of governance structure where anyone with a token can decide how a protocol works or the governance structure where anyone can decide on, can make decisions proportionally to how much they've invested. That doesn't work for everything, right? It might not work for a software company. It might mm -hmm. not work for even like a college club. There are all kinds of organizations that don't necessarily benefit from that structure, but could configure a DAO that has the correct structure for how their organization functions optimally. Just because you have a DAO doesn't mean you have to have governance work that way. It just means you're using Web3 Substrate to architect a governance system. So you're not under the 
umbrella where all business ends up becoming a DAO in the future. You're under the world where DAOs just make sense in certain in certain aspects, in certain concepts, in certain ways, but not for everything. I think that DAOs make sense for lots of organizations and that organizations can configure DAOs to have the governance stru structure that's appropriate mm. for their organization functioning optimally. Right. So just okay. because you have a DAO doesn't mean it has to be a flamingo DAO style proportional mm -hmm. weighted voting decision-making mm -hmm. DAO, right? Yeah. right? For example, you could have a DAO where people buy in and then it's only one person who makes all the decisions and everyone's happy with that. Or it looks like a company, like a traditional C Corp or LLC, where maybe someone's making decisions and there's a board of directors. And then that board of directors mm -hmm. can hire or fire the CEO type person that's making decisions. Web3 is just a substrate. And there's no mm -hmm. reason why a, a Web3 substrate for governance can't be used to create something that's shaped exactly like a traditional C Corp style organization. Mm -hmm. The question is just, will people do that because we have C Corps? And so maybe they'd prefer to use a C Corp. Do you see then big companies having multiple DAOs inside of their company? Like maybe there's a DAO for the C Corp, there's a DAO for, I don't know, the charitable part of the company. Do you think that they end up having just a bunch of branches of DAOs within a, a large corporation, like maybe five, 10 years in the future? It's just what, it, as you speak, it's kind of just what it made me think of. Yeah, I think, I think that the reason DAOs tend to have the use cases they do right now is because there wasn't an as easy a structure within the existing range of corporate governance structures that are incorporated in countries to do the kinds of activities they wanted. So I think we're going to see DAOs proliferate the most where they add some kind of utility that isn't being served by a traditional corporate structure. So mm -hmm. I don't think that necessarily will happen. I think if people feel well served by traditional corporate structures, they'll keep them. And where they don't feel served by that, they'll create DAOs that they'll custom configure to have the structures they want. Yeah, I think the example of what Consensus did with their charitable or grants DAO last year was really interesting where they put all their employees in a DAO and allowed them to vote on the governance of a charitable fund. Like that to me is very interesting. Or I think about... I remember I used to love Cheetos back in the day. And I remember Cheetos used to do like a new flavor every year and you could vote on what you wanted the new flavor to be. And there was this like, not competition, but this like friendly governance of the new Cheetos flavor. Like I could see something like that being a DAO where everyone mm -hmm. could come together across the world and be part of the governance of a flavor, right? And then because you voted, you now get to see how that flavor gets distributed and maybe you get to vote on the bag and the logo and whatnot. I can see corporations using DAOs for small, very specific projects like that. Right, I, I think they'll get more use out of them if they couldn't have used another mm. mechanism to do the same thing. Mm. I think if they already have an existing Web3 community and they're trying to get people to vote on stuff like that, from their Web3 wallets and maybe giving them voting proportionally to how much they've interacted with the product in those wallets, mm -hmm. then it would make sense to spin up a DAO to do that. But if they're working with a normal registration system of previous customers, then they can use mm -hmm. some kind of Web2 system to gather those types of votes. I don't see how that would be adding extra utility. So I think mm -hmm. DAOs are gonna proliferate the most where they're adding speed to market or some kind of utility that people wouldn't have otherwise. Another one of those yeah. utilities can be pseudonymous participation, right? Like that's another, that's another one. Jay, any more questions on DAOs? If not, I have a, a question that I want to ask, which has nothing to do with these six concepts, but just feel like it'd be an interesting question. Do you have anything else on the last concept there? No, bring, bring in the cherry <laughs> on top. What, what surprise <laughs> question do you have? For so <laughs> a, a, a conversation that Jay and I have had a couple of times the last couple of days is what's the next thing that onboards a lot of people into web three? So you had 2020, we had like DeFi summer. So it was like yield. Everyone was like, oh my God, there's yield. And it brought a bunch of people in. 2020, 2021. 2021. No, no, DeFi summer was 2020. 2021 was NFTs. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it was NFTs. 2022, I don't know, probably nothing. But maybe like Reddit NFTs, to be honest, is probably the thing that brought the most people into this space. Uh, maybe there's nothing in 2023. I don't know, because you did say you think prices will be flat and it's just more of a build year. Is there anything in 2023 where you're like, this could happen. It might bring in a bunch of people or are we farther out? And whatever time frame you have, what is that thing that, that finally does it, you think? Yeah, so a couple of different options. I think Web3 Social could bring in a lot of people as, we, as we've spoken about. I think that real world assets on chain. So if people are using 
NFTs or fungible tokens to buy physical things or to buy, let's say, real estate. That'll bring in a lot of people in a way that's decorrelated with the market. Also, large-scale companies doing rewards programs or Web3 native projects that people get really excited about doing their own things that look look like those sort of massive rewards or membership programs could, could do it. I think L2 is really taking off is going to enable a lot of gaming use cases. So I think that's one, one way a lot of people are going to come in. Then it, it, it's, it's easy to forget that genuine DeFi innovation brought us into our last bull market. I think that genuine DeFi innovation is going to keep happening. I think this time it could happen with ZK and zero knowledge proofs. Polygon, which is one of our incredible partners, is building a lot in ZK. Ethereum is really integrating a lot of ZK. Alio, who we also work with, is a ZK L1. Uh, and that's super exciting. I think the potential for configurable privacy for certain kinds of transactions has been a blocker for all kinds of businesses and individuals getting into the space. And I think the ZK world enables new DeFi use cases to take off that haven't existed before in a way that could help bring us back into that energy. Interesting. You think any of those are going to happen in 2023? I, I think they could. I mean, I think it's just based on innovation, right? Like people disagree about who invented yield farming, whether it was Kane from Synthetics, whether it was Andre Crone with YFI, but there was mm -hmm. a moment where that happened and suddenly there's a novel mechanism that a lot of people are excited about that's using the Web3 substrate that's only possible because of Web3 that brings a lot of people in. Mm -hmm. You pair that with the natural Bitcoin halving cycle being at a good moment. You pair that with interest rates being low and tech stocks and mm -hmm. riskier investments taking off. You pair that with that $69 million people sale at Christie's <laughs> to Medicoven. And, suddenly, and you pair that with Michael Saylor putting Bitcoin on the balance sheet and <laughs> a big moment for institutional adoption. And you've woven together all, all the pieces you need for another, another bull market. So a lot of it is cyclic or in my opinion, right? A lot of it's cyclic or related to macro, macro policy, but a lot of it is actually kind of innovation and event-based and there needs to be the, the right amount of oxygen and then the tinder catches fire. Love it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So before we jump into a speed round, just a couple of fun questions for you, Amanda. I want to jump back to the book quickly. When is it coming out? How can people get it? Definitely. We'll put a link in the show notes for, I believe the pre-order that's coming, coming out or will be out mm -hmm. by the time that this time the show airs. Tell us a little bit more about it. Cause I want to make sure that everybody listening gets this book. Cause it's going to be so great. Yeah, absolutely. So it's called Web3 Marketing, a handbook for the next internet revolution. It's coming out from Wiley on April 4th, 2023. The pre-sale link should be in the show notes and you can grab your copy now and you'll get it in April. Is, uh, is it digital? Is there an NFT? <laughs> oh, there is. Yes. Ah, um, there you okay. go. Of course. It, 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 it is digital. <laughs> there is a unique claim code inside every book and a website where you can go to enter your claim code, which gets you an NFT, which gets you into a Web3 marketing Discord community where you can get access to regular content about three market, Web3 marketing, a peer group, mentors, basically people to ask all your, all your questions to help you along to create new projects together. Amazing. The book is going to become a community that makes so much sense. I love it. Okay, let's jump into speed round. Couple quick questions for you before we wrap. First one, what's an NFT you'll never sell? Ooh, an NFT I'll never sell. So on the front cover of my book is a Chromie Squiggle from Artblocks. Mm -hmm. And Eric Calderon, AKA Snowfrow, is a really great friend. And he allowed me to license a squiggle that I personally own to use on the front cover. I feel like that the, the image of that squiggle, it's an up arrow, but after a little bit of halting progress, mm -hmm. I think it really conveys the, the, the message of the book and, and the, the fact that we've used an NFT I think is really significant and that community will really recognize it. And I would never sell that. That's awesome. I love Squiggles, such a great project. Okay, one thing you've bought recently for under $100 that brings you joy does not have to be digital token, could be something physical. A standing desk. I definitely mm. have enjoyed, <laughs> enjoyed. And one of my new year's resolutions is to, is to move between standing and sitting all day so I can stay 
stay focused and not get too sleepy. That's what I got Kyle, right now. That's, that's your cue to sit down right now, Kyle. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know it. what else? Okay. What else? Oh, yeah. here's, here's what else. Another, another really inexpensive fix for someone who spends a lot of time on the computer. I was starting to get carpal tunnel. And instead of getting surgery and wearing a brace, and obviously some people do need surgery, I got these funny little, these little rubber bands uh, that you use to connect all your fingers. People who are professional climbers actually use them to strengthen their grip. I think they might be called grippies. And I do okay. some hand exercises with them and it yeah. totally stopped my carpal tunnel pain. And I do that every, every morning and I've never had it come back again and never had to have any ah. physical therapy or surgery. So that might be a hack for some people out there that also are spending a lot of time on the computer. It's a great hack. And that's actually probably under a hundred bucks. I was like, where are you getting a standing desk for under a hundred dollars? <laughs> oh, I think, I think it was under a hundred dollars. I think it was yeah, on Amazon. That's that's and then these grippy things must be like seven ninety nine or something. Yeah, that's, that's great. great. I love that. And it's, and it's a routine too, which also is such a great way to start the new year. So that's awesome. <laughs> okay. Final question. If you had a billboard that 1 billion people were going to see, what would you write on it? Hmm. I think right now I might write not your keys, not your crypto. And maybe that's some kind of QR code to teach people about root ownership of assets and self-sovereign control of your own value. You can tell you're a crypto OG. I appreciate that. And you're actually the first person that said that. And we ask that to every single person. Yeah. So surprised no one has said that yet because like everyone should be saying that. So well done. <laughs> Thanks. Amazing. Amanda, thanks so much for the time. Thanks for sharing all these concepts with us today. Super helpful, wonderful conversation. I really appreciate it and very excited for the book to come out. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy. We hope this helps you along your Web3 journey. If it does, please share this episode and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Nothing in this podcast was financial advice. Crypto and Web3 can be risky. You can literally lose it all. In fact, if you invest on account of what we say, you probably will lose it all. So don't do that. In all honesty, the point of this podcast is to remove the noise of markets and price and focus on utility and implementation anyway. So you should not take any of this as financial advice. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.